Our first speaker is Ryan Cross. He's the founder and CEO of Distill Analytics. His team is unearthing and measuring the human factors in decision making with impacts from Wall Street to the uh, military. Ryan, please join us on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. You, got a, you don't need a mic or anything? You're good? All right. And yeah. this is the yeah, slide yeah. thing? Yeah, you're All right. Um, let's make this thing go. Your slides aren't up yet. <laughs> Sweet. Well, uh, you can see me twice now. Um, so I, I run a, a, a small uh, a technology company called Distill Analytics. And what we were, what we were interested in doing is uh, remote psychological assessment, which is um, usually it, it collects people at parties, um, mostly because of the kind of curious uh, phrasing of the, of the title. So what exactly do I mean when I say remote psychological assessment? Well, uh, remote in this case means people that we can't talk to directly. This is groups of individuals who are uh, uh, sort of beyond uh, the, the types of individuals that you or I could interact with, so astronauts is an excellent example, or people who are, are mountaineers or search and rescue individuals, people who are leading groups into combat, foreign heads of state, uh, people who, have, who are going through immense psychological trauma. You can't necessarily bring them into a room. Say you're a Rohingya refugee fleeing Burma, and you, we are able to capture something that you're saying. That's what we mean by uh, remote. And then on the psychological side, we're trying to understand how people function. And on the assessment side, we're not doing a clinical assessment, but we are trying to understand how people are operating. And we can measure all this. And this raises the question, I mean, who does this and why? And so, I mean, we do this, um, but who's interested? And it started off as a series of, of academic studies, roughly over the last 50 years. Uh, the field progresses slowly. A series of, of academics publish some quirky papers, such as how to predict international warfare. And it predicts a strong word. But the idea becomes, well, if you can understand how someone's cognitive pattern is changing, you can begin to understand the actions they might take. And so uh, at, at Distill, who does this? It's, it's myself. Uh, uh, my two co-founders, Caleb and Leslie. Uh, Caleb brings an immense technical talent to the, to the table. Uh, I've got a pe very peculiar subject expertise involving um, remote psychological assessment. Um, I finished an MBA with Michelle, and that's where we met, uh, uh, and a couple other folks in the audience. Um, when you tell the career services people that you do psychological assessments remotely, uh, your resume possibilities are really quite low. Uh, so you sort of have to start a quirky company. And then we, we also combine this uh, with the technology and we take these methods. The methods have been around, like I said, for the better part of 50 years. So really, it's, it's nothing all that new. But what we are able to do with Caleb's expertise is wrap some uh, you know, excellent co-founders, a method that's quite old, in some incredible technology and then throw around it some business process to begin to create a company. And now there's all types of data that we could have been interested in. Uh, this is where Caleb's traveled. Uh, he, uh, like any good modern technology enthusiast, uh, tracks where he goes. And so this is uh, you know, where, he's, where, he's, where he's going. Uh, and then this is what his heart's doing on different periods in time. Now, I've never profiled Caleb, and it becomes a challenge. How do you actually uh, uh, profile someone and then represent it visually? So. Um, uh, one analogy is, is uh, radar, uh, and so you can understand that radar can guide airplanes. It provides a snapshot in time until the radar uh, you know, sweeps around again and, and can tell you where planes are. Now, we can understand that this doesn't tell us exactly everything about that plane, but it can infer characteristics. And so in th the same way, we can run a psychological assessment to understand the, the, the landscape. And in our case, the image that comes back can tell us all sorts of interesting things. But the material that we're interested in is specifically text. And so we take unstructured text, transcripts and that sort of thing, or, or interviews or written text, and take that in as, as our data input and run analysis on it. And so 
one of the interesting use cases is how do you tell uh, if, you can, if, if there's someone violent in a large group or a small group that's violent in a larger group. And for the most part, we have tools that do this. There's police services that go out there and try to investigate this sort of stuff. But a lot of groups produce information, and some of them you can distinguish as saying, okay, from our point of view, this is the psychological assessment point of view, these groups aren't dangerous. Other groups, who you might call radical extremists, are people who are like, I understand exactly why the IRA is engaging in violence, but we as Sinn Féin do not engage in violence. It's possible to cognitively distinguish those two groups. So these are groups that are operating hand in glove with each other in terms of, of uh, their worldview. What gets even more interesting is when you begin to pick up people you'd sort of classically call terrorists, what you can end up finding is that the Earth Liberation Front is more closely aligned from a cognitive point of view to the IRA and to white supremacists than they are with either of their analogs. So Sinn Féin versus the IRA or uh, radical white nationalists and this sort of distinction. And we're doing this again from a cognitive and motivational profile and the groups stand apart like oil and water. And so on this one measure we have something called cognition and I'll tell you a bit about that in just a second. The other one we've got something we call dominance and one is related to black and white thinking, so the incre increasingly black and white thinking, which is sort of intuitive. And then also we look at how people are motivated by power or the willingness to dominate others as it comes through in speech. And so on the cognition front, these things that we're interested in are how specific individuals use and think about in their information environment, not the content. We're, we find the, 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 this has nothing to do with content whatsoever. So for example, we're sitting in this building. Right now it just looks like to my eyes that this audience is sort of sitting, you know, you're, you're clearly going up and there's a bunch of chairs and all this sort of stuff. Now I understand that there's a structure underneath the chairs holding everything up here. What, I, what we're interested in is in that structure. Uh, a, a designer might be interested in the colors of the room and that sort of stuff. And in the same way, words function as a veneer on top of an underlying cognitive structure. And that's what we're interested in, in this case. And so uses for this type of analysis include uh, the U.S. Central Command, who was interested in profiling Bashar al-Assad of Syria and understanding as a contingency under the Obama administration, when should we try to engage Assad? Now, you, now, when do you go up and try to negotiate with this guy? Now, it turns out that he's actually quite complex in his thinking, but he also changes in responses to stress, like any individual. We can map when's the best timing to go in to, to try to negotiate with him. And we can also understand when dis deterrence might fail. And so the US military starts to call this cognitive battle space maneuver. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can try to imagine how much space you have in your mind for other ideas. We're also interested in when you try to engage someone in negotiation, can you actually negotiate with them successfully and what's that dynamic? In this case, there was a study done on the Chiapas rebel group in southern Mexico. They were essentially a, a sort of proto-Marxist peasant revolution. They tried to fight the central government. What they, you know, they, they sort of get out there, start to do their thing. When are you going to negotiate with them? And it turns out that if the government comes in to negotiate and is quite complex in their positioning, it will lead the rebel group to arrive at a more complex uh, worldview. And then a solution becomes emergent. As someone who uh, is, is able to negotiate different ranges of, of thinking about information, when the, the, this is what we're interested in. And so we can actually untangle that means we can begin to understand when it becomes appropriate to time things. And in one case, the, the government representative is having an off day, their cognition lowers, and it turns out that the rebel group isn't able to raise their cognition during that period of time. So all about timing and understanding when different groups are gonna be able to engage. Now, so fine, you can understand when a group's ready to go in terms of negotiations, you're tracking potential sort of terror groups, but you also wanna understand what motivates people and so we're interested in the drivers for action. In one case, we want to understand what drives people like astronauts. And they're the prototypical example of people who are, are, are sort of willing to go way out and, and take measured risk. And these individuals profile exceptionally high 
on those motivational measures related to performance. We're also interested in dominance, so people who want to control. It's sort of a Machiavellian type of stereotype. In this case, in business, what we find here is if you are motivated by power, you will destroy company value. If you're motivated by performance, you will enhance company value. In politics, if you're motivated by power, you will likely succeed. The other group will be frustrated. The final group is about community and trying to understand different, uh, trying to create a, a sense of oneness with a larger group. And so we can begin to understand these different teams uh, along those, those axes of the different drivers. And what gets kind of interesting as we, we would talk about you know, trying to build community, well, the military groups that we looked at, they're already a very tight community. Uh, certainly, they also have a high need for power and dominance and control, but we can see how this breaks apart across different groups. And with this sort of fidelity, begin, we begin to start to tease apart different ways in which different groups will react. Where it starts to get kind of nifty is when we can combine all these metrics. We can look at the motivational profiles of Putin's Russia and understand in 2008, prior to the conflict, that not only was the Russian government very low in their cognition, meaning they were seeing their world in a black and white worldview, and this trend showed up all of a sudden in their statements. They became increasingly motivated by a dominance orientation, and roughly eight weeks later, the invasion of Georgia happened in August of 08. And so we're not saying we can actually predict what's going to happen. What we can tell you is that this leadership team is becoming one-dimensional, and they're spiking in their need for dominance. It's an interesting data point and it sits about six week to eight weeks out. We can also look at, say, spikes or surges in violence in the Sudan region. When is this going to happen? When are we going to see mass killing events? Exactly the same pattern reappears. All of a sudden, the central government's cognition will collapse, the dominance will spike, and two to six weeks later, you will see violence. Now, uh, the war stuff's interesting. That's kind of my background. Uh, when I was doing this work at UBC, it was all about the military stuff. Um, turns out it's hard to run a business uh, just doing a weird, quirky analysis of Bashar al-Assad. Um, <laughs> but there is some interest in making money. And so if you show up all of a sudden, you say to a fund manager, uh, hey, we've got a measure of a management team. Uh, usually it's an old white guy and he'll say, uh, well, that's my expertise. How could you possibly know this? And so what we did is we challenged essentially a fund manager and said, uh, give us two companies in which there's public statements available and we'll try to differentiate between them. We'll track them over a 10-year period. We will forecast what's going to happen with them, and we'll also generate a profile. And so we looked at uh, the wonderful world of Canadian auto parts manufacturers uh, and, and looked at, uh, uh, <laughs> looked at uh, they're, they're not actually called company A, B, C, and D, but that's about as exciting as they get. Uh, what actually, uh, we, we don't have our legal paperwork that says I can't give you investment advice, um, but in any case, uh, they'd invested in, in these two companies, the orange one and the blue one, and uh, they had foregone the increase in company A. Yet, this, this asset manager had said, we know people. You know, the, the old guy in the office, he, he'll get in his private jet, fly across the country to go for dinner with these guys, and in, and in 2014, we started to get concerned that company B wasn't gonna perform, and at this point, they're starting to you know, be way down. And then by, uh, they put someone on the board, and by 2017, they're like, all right, we're out. We, we can't keep on stomaching these losses. We've forgone like a 500% increase in stock price. And so he said, all right. So we profiled this, and, and Caleb and Leslie and I got, went down to their office. We profiled them over three weeks, looking just at their quarterly earnings calls. So every, every three months, they get together, make a big phone call. We get those transcripts. We run analysis on them. Well, what does it show? It shows that... Uh, in 2013, on a combined measure of those three drivers and cognition, uh, the one team isn't performing very well. And certainly, you know, it dips and rises a little bit, but they stay stuck quite low. And so we show up and say, hey, uh, in, in 2013, when you were thinking something bad was happening, we were showing that for a previous two years. Um, would you be interested in buying something like this? And they say, no, 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 we'd never buy this. Uh, our benefit is knowing people. We know people. And we're sort of sitting there going, well, the data says you don't. Uh, <laughs> and so that creates an interesting marketing challenge. And, 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 and any of the previous panel can talk to you about the marketing challenge that, that might be and how 
Uh, so what, now we're trying to stuck trying to sell this thing and, and in Sweden talking to all sorts of people and how to build a product. But uh, really, that's what we're trying to do is, is say, what, how can we take this weird, quirky science and drive it into a, a business product uh, that comes from the field of social sciences, which is all validated. It's got measures of, I mean, we we're talking about values earlier. There is something called the Schwartz Universal Values Survey. There are, are measures of this, and we're trying to take that sort of messy, fuzzy, human, put them through some social science process, and then uh, start to understand and measure them over time. One of the other interesting things, I actually forgot this slide was here, because that would have been a great ending, um, is to say, uh, we actually profiled the, the individual executives, and uh, one of them, uh, it, you know, the, uh, oh, that formatting's also screwed. Um, anyways, uh, the chairman of company B, we sat there, Caleb and I, and said, we went to this executive, he said, you know, okay, we got all these names for all these people, uh, who is this guy? You know, he's the chairman, he shows up on all these calls, he profiles uniquely weird in our data, like against all 30 other executives. And, and, and uh, this, the one woman at the firm is like, oh, <laughs> you know, if, if our principal was here, he would tell you all sorts of stories about this guy. Uh, turns out he just does an excellent job of destroying company value. Uh, the CEO at, at company A uh, is a exceptionally qualified CEO and is able to balance competing needs of their company. And, the, and in contrast, what, uh, the, the, the middle two, they're sort of more quirkiness. Uh, one guy has got no motivation that we can pick up. He's, <laughs> but he's an, exceptionally, he's an exceptionally talented uh, technical authority in finance. He just isn't a good CFO. Uh, CFOs need to have leadership skills because uh, they're leading teams. So uh, you imagine a highly competent engineer uh, all of a sudden being put into a leadership position. That's not where they're able to perform. And in this case, this guy goes on. He has a, a phenomenal tenure as a senior VP of finance, number of different companies. Um, I think, yeah, OK. So this is my actual concluding slide. Uh, when I was talking to, to Paula about what I should talk about, she said, well, what else can you do with this sort of stuff? Well, we've been chatting with someone who wants to profile ICO teams, and so trying to avoid those pump and dump situations. Uh, but there's not much data on those folks. All I have is this white paper. We can actually go out and profile that, because it's unstructured text, and we like unstructured text. There's a bunch of fascinating work being done on de-radicalization. How do you de-radicalize uh, uh, someone from the Al-Shabaab militant movement? Well, what you need to do is you need to accept that their worldview is legitimate. Very challenging politically. You can imagine uh, going, you know, all of a sudden this government program is revealed and they're paying someone to say, your terrorism aims are entirely legitimate. But if you can enter into that mindset and then begin to de-radicalize someone through using cognitive assessments is what would happen. Uh, negotiations, uh, we've, we've tracked some of our own internal team negotiations across these measures to understand when we're reaching agreement. And it's, it's fantastically interesting because you can be like, well, look, the data shows that uh, uh, Ryan was uh, basically not thinking very complexly about this. And <laughs> turns out uh, uh, most of the time, uh, Caleb and Leslie are, are correct, but they then lower their cognitive profile to sort of bring Ryan in. Uh, <laughs> uh, so as, as, as someone who s suffers from critic, uh, sort of cr crippling anxiety, I'm also interested in mental health challenges. And if you think of mental health as a, as a or, or mental health challenges as a disease of cognition, and we can track cognition, then presumably we could also begin to understand as you begin to enter into, say, a major anxiety episode or a major depressive episode. In the same way that NASA is interested in understanding their astronauts' evolution uh, when they can't actually intervene directly. So you want to know and pick up markers in text when situations are changing. And that's, uh, oh, the final one is educational assessment. There's some really interesting work being done on tracking cognition and how you think about the topic that you're being educated in. And those correlate perfectly with uh, educational outcomes. And so could you track people on an ongoing basis? Those are some other applications. Uh, that's who we are, and thanks for listening. Yeah.